Very good. Uh, we have uh, the opportunity now to uh, hear from Pastor Clay Ward, and uh, Pastor Clay has gone with me. Have we gone twice together or once together? Once overseas and once together. Yeah, we, we went overseas, and then we taught together in Pennsylvania uh, doing um, DM2 workshops, and uh, so he's, um, he's, he's actually uh, authored a couple of our curriculum, uh, our curricula, and uh, he's uh, just a, a, been a tremendous blessing and a, a great backer and proponent of what DM2 is doing, and in fact, DM2 is, is his as much as it is mine. I mean, it's, uh, uh, he breathes the same air and uh, thinks the same way, believes in training uh, the next generation of leaders, and so I'm delighted today that he's here. Uh, he's only got five kids, so uh, he's got some catch. Or, um, he's almost got six, all right. Just about got six, so he's trying hard to catch up with Pastor Robert. But uh, I, I gave up a long time ago at five, and so yeah, quitter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, I'm delighted to, to have uh, Pastor Clay as uh, one who's going to teach you, but also as a, as a brother in, in the Lord and as a, a fellow worker in the gospel. And uh, so come on and give us the word of God. Well, after that intro... I need to say what John said last night. We were talking about how the sections are uh, divvied up. And I was telling him my first section. He says, you're the immoral sinner. I said, yeah, you're right. That's, that's me. So, But uh, I'd like to welcome everyone here. Some of you have been here since the beginning of the week. Some haven't. But uh, I am the pastor here at Plurima Bible Church. And it's a, a pleasure to have you here. And it's a pleasure to be involved with DM2. And uh, so um, I don't want to uh, take up too much time of what we need to teach. So just welcome, and if we can assist you in any way, please please let us know. So we're in uh, Romans 1 through 8, the immoral, immoral center. I'll only be dealing with the immoral center. But if you look on your back cover, uh, where, uh, well, turn my thing on here. Uh, where we're going through and uh, filling in those things, the gospel of grace in 1, 1 through 17, the accountable for the gospel in 1, 1 through 5, uh, addresses the Romans 1, 6 through 7, aspirations in the gospel 1, 8 through 15, the acclamation of the gospel, salvation to all who believe in 1, 16 through 17, and those ones should have uh, filled out now. And now we're getting ready to look at the three types of sinners in 1, 18 through 320. That's the large section. And again, the immoral sinner is the one we're going to be looking at. And the immoral sinner is uh, described in several ways here in Romans 1, 18 through 32. So Romans 1, 18 through 320, God's justice is required because man's sin requires God's condemnation. What we're about to get into in Romans 1, 18 through 32, Paul is going to establish now why man needs God's righteousness. And the method here is uh, someone's got to be lost before they want to be found. And he's about to establish what the problem is with man in, in, in looking at who God is. He's going to tell us about the righteousness of God. And so he's, he's establishing that Man without God's righteousness is under God's wrath. And so this is what he's preparing to uh, move into in the book of Romans. So Romans 1, 18 through 32, God's condemnation rightly falls on the immoral sinner. And we're going to take this uh, just a section by section here. We'll start with the first three verses. And because this is a large uh, section, so instead of reading it all at once, we'll just do a little bit at a time. So let's begin with Romans 1, 18 through 20. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. 
For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Now, if you remember back of Romans 1, 17, when uh, Pastor Ames was going there, it reads, For it is in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The righteousness of God is revealed you know, through the message of the gospel. And also the wrath of God is revealed through what has in his righteousness. And these things are revealed not only in the special revelation of the gospel, but there's also a sense of the unrighteousness of man being revealed in what has been made. In Romans 1, 18 through 21, God condemns immoral sinners because they suppress the truth. God condemns immoral sinners because they suppress the truth. And Romans 1, 17 declares that the righteousness of God is revealed from heaven through the gospel. The righteousness of God is revealed from heaven through the gospel. Conversely, Romans 1, 18 declares that the wrath of God is revealed from, the he from heaven against all ungodliness. And it's an interesting thing about that wrath which man understands. Because in every culture... Uh, especially where there's sacrifices involved in the religious system. What is the purpose of the sacrifice? To appease the wrath of some god or goddess. They know there's a wrath of God there, but they have perverted the wrath of the Creator into a worship of the creation. That's what all this is going to be about, as we see here in Romans chapter 1. They understand that there's a standard there, that there's an absolute standard, but... They are trying to make that standard based on themselves. They reject the truth that because they are suppressing it in their unrighteous state. Romans 1, 18a, man needs God's righteousness because in his sinful state, he stands directly under God's wrath, the very wrath of God. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed. That word revealed, apocalypto, in the Greek meaning to unveil something, unveil a reality that is is there, but it's now being revealed, it's being seen. God's wrath is revealed, it's made manifest from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Of men, note who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. In Romans 1, 18b, man's, uh, man's ungodliness and unrighteousness violate God's righteous character. Therefore, God must respond in wrath. It's a violation of the holy character of God. And as a result of this, God is going to have to take action. They are violating God's standard, which is the absolute standard established by the creator of the universe. So for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness. Note that it being revealed is just something they know. Because it's revealed, because it's made manifest, this is something known because they re recognize that they suppress this truth in that unrighteousness. Ungodliness is sin or rebellion against God. Anything that opposes his character or existence is ungodly, not like God, and suppresses the truth. They know that God is there, but they're choosing to reject it. Ungodliness is anything that violates God's righteous standard. It's not only missing the mark, it's also willfully hitting a wrong mark. Sin is seen as something that is totally against God. And man is aware of this from what has been revealed. Unrighteousness is sin or injustice directed toward other humans. Anything that defies God's commandments suppresses the truth. So in their unrighteous rebellion, the unbeliever, the immoral sinner, is suppressing the truth of the understanding of who God is and that there is the wrath of God upon them. This word here, to suppress, says ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. Kateko, a present participle, meaning this is an ongoing action. They continue to keep pressure on the truth. And I like to think of it as, as a beach ball. If you've ever been in the pool and you take a beach ball and you want to stick it under the water, it takes effort to keep it suppressed under the water. And the moment you let a little pressure off, the beach ball pops up. 
This is what the unbelieving world is doing to the truth. They're working really hard to keep the truth of God's existence and the wrath of God under pressure. And our job with the gospel is to come along and hit it at a point where the pressure is released and boom, there it is. And they have to come face to face with it again. It's my belief that in the world we live in, where we, everybody's got a cell phone or walking around with headphones on, what they are doing is they're keeping themselves constantly entertained so they don't have to think about reality. They're not, that keeps them from having to let the pressure off and face the truth of the matter that God's wrath is revealed from heaven. They are working mighty hard to say no to God. Again, Romans 1, 18 deals with this righteous character, what I call the integrity of God, based on four attributes of God. His righteousness, his justice, his love, and his truth. Often in Scripture, you'll find justice and righteousness used together, especially in the Psalms. You'll find truth and love used together. Often love in the Old Testament will be the Hebrew word kesed for loving kindness. Sometimes, like in this psalm here, in Psalm 89, 14, you find all four attributes. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Loving kindness and truth go before you. The aspect of God's righteous character is what's being revealed from heaven, and those in unrighteousness want to suppress that revelation. The righteousness of God is important. What the righteousness of God demands, the justice of God executes. God's righteousness demands his righteousness. And if a person doesn't have that, the justice of God has to condemn the person. But this righteous standard and justice of God is, all of it is motivated by the love of God, and it's all based on the truth of God. You can go check it out in the Word of God, which is God's grace expression to us, his special revelation to us to tell us more details. What we're getting ready to look at here in Romans 1 is the general revelation of creation that generally communicates the existence of God. Special revelation of the Bible gives us more of the details. And so when we start studying Scripture, we'll start seeing these attributes come together. And when we think about holiness, the holy character of God, this is what the Scripture puts together with justice and righteousness. His holy character, the fact that there is an absolute standard, has been revealed. How has it been revealed? That's what we get into in verse 19 here in just a moment. In Romans 1, 18e, man knows the truth of God's righteous character, but actively chooses to deny that truth. He makes the choice. It's a conscious choice to deny the truth. And no one's going to buy the lie until they've rejected the truth. And we can take it all the way back to Noah in the ark. We all got off the same boat with Noah and his family. They all got off the boat with the truth. And as the population began to grow, they took the truth with them. But then over time, they perverted it. And they began worshiping the creature rather than the creator. That's exactly what Paul is explaining through here, the exchange of the worship of the creator for the worship of the creature. That's the problem that's taking place. And every person possesses knowledge of God. Romans 1, 19 again, it says, Because that which is known about God is evident within them. Why? Because God made it evident to them. Every person that's born in, in, in the, being an image bearer of God knows God exists. That means there's no true atheist out there. What the atheist is doing is he's choosing to believe something different. He's choosing to believe that there's no God because he's suppressing the truth of God's existence. He's hoping that there's no God. He needs to change his mind about that and trust in Jesus Christ and understand who Jesus Christ is in the gospel. There's no one that's going to be able to stand at the evaluation throne, the great white throne judgment, and say, God, I didn't know you were there. If you had just revealed yourself, I would, have, I would have believed you. Well, the problem is God's revealing himself 24-7. There's not a moment where he's not revealing himself. He has made it evident, known about God, has made it evident within them, for by God had made it evident to them. All civilizations and cultures understand right and wrong because God places it into the heart of every human being. God has established right and wrong in the conscience. 
You'll hear more about this in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. The standard of right and wrong that's within the conscience of man. But everybody's got a standard of right and wrong. Even the thief has a standard of right and wrong. If you go and rob the 7-Eleven with someone, and then you get in the car and you pull the gun on him and say, give me the money we stole, he's going to say, that's wrong. You ought not do that. We robbed it together. Everybody's got some standard of right and wrong. The issue is, is that standard something outside ourselves in Creator God, or is that standard something we're making from within ourselves? And, of course, man wants to be God, and in wanting to be God, he wants to set the standard, and that's the problem. So all civilizations and cultures understand right and wrong. They have a sense of absolutes. Most, most cultures will agree that stealing is wrong, at least at some level. Uh, some cultures will uh, say that uh, you can lie. Uh, lying is a good thing to do if you can fool your friend into believing you, and then you can kill them off. That's their standard. They would say that's a good standard. That's a perverted standard. Other cultures, in some level, they're going to say that murder is wrong. In some, in some cases, in some cases, they say it's not, but they've got a standard. Everyone has some sort of standard of right and wrong. And what you have in a, in a culture, whether it's written down or whether it's unwritten, you have a law code. And that law code of the culture or the nation is an expression of the standard of that culture. It's a moral standard, perverted or not. It's a moral standard that's been codified in the law. And so it's not a matter of, of morality being legislated. It's a matter of whose morality is being legislated. Every culture has their own morality that you can see in what they do and the law code in which they operate in. So because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. It is made evident within them in the conscience. And then also to work with that, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature. And I love that contrast here. Invisible attributes have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. In other words, God's creation preaches the message of his existence so that every heart understands. God has also written eternity into everyone's heart. Eternity in the heart in Ecclesiastes 3.11. Let's turn over there real quick, if you will. Ecclesiastes is one of those strange books. It's one of the few books, really the only book of the Bible, that has uh, a human viewpoint written into it. Because Solomon is saying, look, I've pursued it. It's one thing for me to tell you that money is not everything, so I don't have any. But it's one thing for Solomon to come along and tell you money is not everything, because he had it all, see? And he comes through and says, money, power, fame, pleasure, none of it is worth anything. Only thing that matters is life lived in submission to God. And in chapter 3, we have that famous phrase or famous passage there as a time for everything, uh, made famous by some singers sometimes, but it's a famous passage. And in Ecclesiastes 3.11, we then read, he has made everything appropriate in its time. He's just been a bunch of verses talking about a time to, to kill, a time to heal, different things. He has also set eternity in their heart. That is, this concept of immortality, the concept of no end, has been set in the image bearer. Yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. In other words, that eternity in the heart has been put in there to, for man to look beyond time and yet can't be satisfied with that unless he turns to God only by turning to God only by turning to the creator and submitting to him and being in a right relationship with him can eternity in the heart be satisfied sometimes I refer to that as the God-shaped vacuum and if you reject creator God then you're going to want to fill that vacuum with something else because man's going to worship it's a question of what he's going to worship or who he's going to worship. The creation testifies about the creator's divine nature. The creation testifies about the creator's divine nature. Since we're over here in the wisdom literature, let's turn to Psalm 19 real quick. This is a psalm of David. And you can picture David out in the fields keeping his father's sheep. 
watching after them. And on those nights where the sheep are now being lulled to sleep as he's played his harp and got them to sleep, and now he's staring up into the starry sky, contemplating his God that he worships, and he begins to think about everything he sees. He says in Psalm 19:1, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. What is the glory of God? His character, who he is, his holiness. And their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. What's the work of his hands? The creation. So the creation is continually testifying to the existence of God. It says day to day pours forth speech. And night to night reveals knowledge. So whether it's during the day or at night, you can see the creator's handiwork. But watch verse 3. There is no speech nor are there words. He said day to day it pours forth speech, and now he says there is no speech. This is what's great about general revelation. There's no language barrier. See, the language barrier established at Babel doesn't work with general revelation because everyone, no matter what language they speak physically, can see the handiwork of the Creator. And so this is a universal language of God's existence from what God has created. Their voice is not heard, but everyone sees and understands. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he's placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of its chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run its course. In other words, the sun every morning rises in the east, runs its course to set in the west. And only in biblical Christianity can we say that's going to happen again tomorrow. And that's going to continue until God says, all right, it's over. You can't say that in any other worldview, only in biblical Christianity. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Nothing can hide from the heat of the sun, if you will. It shines forth just as no one can hide from the general revelation of God's existence. It's there. You can't go anywhere where God's existence isn't being declared by the creation. All people possess the mental capacity to recognize God's existence and are therefore without excuse for rejecting him. Again, no one's going to be standing at the great white throne judgment going, who is that up there? They're all going to know. They already know. They just don't want to submit. I like to think of general revelation as a radio tower. Creation is constantly transmitting a message. And each of us, as image bearers, have been created with eternity in the heart. And so that radio tower sends out a message 24-7 that God exists. And we're all born with this eternity in the heart to hear that message. But now just like when you're riding down the road in your car and you have a radio, if you don't have it on, you don't hear the message. Now we're all born with the switch on. But we can make a choice, as Paul tells us in Romans, to turn the switch off. That doesn't stop the message. The message keeps going. But God has given man the choice that if he wants to switch it off, he can. And through bad decisions, the immoral sinners we see here, they can turn it off and the message goes mute. But the message keeps going forth, whether they want to admit it or not. The message continues to be transmitted by the radio tower of creation. And that's why there's no excuse. You can say, you know, someone could say, did you hear that on the radio the other day? No, I didn't. Well, why not? Don't you have one? And turn, all you have to do is turn it on, see? There's no excuse for not having listened to the Tennessee Vols play the other day. You can get that anywhere in the world. You might not want to, but you could. So this is the thing. The message of creation goes forth 24-7, and man is either responding to it or not responding to it based on their own decision. All right, let's go back to Romans now. In Romans 1, uh, 21, let's take, uh, let's take 21 through uh, 25 right here. He says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. Now note that. They knew God. But what happened? They didn't honor him. They didn't give him the honor as creator. Nor did they give thanks to him. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Let's stop at that point right there and talk about these verses here. 
Romans 1, 21 through 31, God is correct in condemning immoral sinners because they have rejected the truth. They have rejected the clear truth of God's existence and decided to suppress that in their ungodliness and in their unrighteousness. So let's look at the downward descent of sinful humanity. In Romans 3, 21 through 22, man's depravity deserves judgment. Ignorance of God comes with a price tag. There are consequences for not believing in God and not believing the gospel. These are eternal consequences. As believers, there are consequences for having a wrong gospel, for not understanding the spiritual life. There are eternal repercussions, not where you're going to spend eternity, but in relationships to what we're going to be doing in eternity. You'll see later on with the Second Timothy passage. I forget which section is in, but someone's going to talk about that Second Timothy passage of what there is to lose as a believer. Not your salvation, but there are consequences for not living out in phase two sanctification. And there are eternal consequences for not believing in Creator God and not believing in the gospel. The futility of their mind. Futility or failure to recognize God as creator and give honor to Him has grave consequences. The Old Testament Hebrew word for uh, futility is abel, which is the word also for idolatry. It's a vapor. It's a vanity. It has no value to it whatsoever. Note what the text says again. It says, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. It's verse 21. But they became futile in their speculations. Now, let's think about that for a moment. Speculations about what? Well, all kinds of things. But what dominates our culture today is speculations on how everything began. You know, well, it all began with a big bang or it all life began on the back of crystals or, you know, those little hamburgers or life began whatever. They're speculating, foolish speculations. Only, only these foolish speculations would come as a result of rejecting the truth. Man will believe all sorts of strange things once the truth has been rejected. And so this is what's going on. It's the futility of their mind. And as a result, their foolish heart. Note the Bible says it's foolish. Paul says this is foolish thinking. It's darkened. It gets worse as they continue to go that way. And they profess to be wise, but they're actually fools. Feudal thinking results from not honoring God as creator. They didn't honor him. They didn't give thanks to him. And so they became uh, basically uh, a vapor in their thinking. It had no value. It had no, real re- uh, no reality to it. Feudal thinking produces wrong reasoning, which results in ignorance and which leads to idolatry. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, verse 17. Now we're in that section of Ephesians. Now that's the application section. Paul's putting the shoe leather on what it means to be in Christ. He's been spending three chapters on our identification in Christ, and now this is what we're to do. And he began with this certain way in which we are to walk, walk in a manner worthy of our calling in 4.1. And he goes through ways that is possible, what is needed for that to be possible. And now in verse 17 he says, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, in the vanity, the vapor of their mind, being darkened, same thing we saw in Romans, being darkened in their understanding, in their reasonings, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. They weren't born with that hardness. They hardened as they rejected that cre- that. Uh, testimony from creation and they turned off the radio now they were born separated from God but God wants all to come to repentance he wants all to be saved so the call to salvation goes forth everywhere all the time and it starts with the general revelation that's why Paul when he uh, is giving the gospel at uh, Athens and the Areopagus, he doesn't begin with the cross and the resurrection he begins with creator creature distinction 
because they are worshiping these idols that they think are whatever it is, their creator or whatever it is. And he begins with who God is. And as soon as he mentions the resurrection, they cut him off. They don't want to hear anymore. Some of them began to sneer. Others says, well, we'll talk about this later on. And so Paul left. There were some who believed, though, and you always have those kind of three responses there. And so he's, he's using the same terminology, the hardness of the heart. The, the, that would be that suppression of truth and unrighteousness. They become darkened in their thinking. Verse 19, and they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality, the immoral sinner, for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. And Paul says, but you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed since you have heard him and have been taught in him just as the truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, the impurity, the practice of every kind of evil, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self. This is what the believer can do, the one who has believed the gospel. So Paul is telling us as believers not to walk that way like we once did as unbelievers. The same walk that we're finding in Romans chapter 1. Colossians 3 says something similar. He In Colossians 3, he tells us about our identification in Christ to set our mind on the things above and consider ourselves dead and our life hidden with God in Christ. Therefore, consider the earthly members of your body as dead, the immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For these are the things that the wrath of God comes upon. These are the things we have to avoid. So I want to talk just a minute about idolatry. And this isn't in your notebook, but... Uh, out of what we saw there in Ephesians 4. Idolatry is a religious system. Idolatry is a religious system. Religion can involve morality, it can involve immorality, but idolatry is religion. Man's going to worship something. He's either going to worship the Creator or something in the creation. And often the time, when he worships something in the creation, idolatry normally involves some sort of image which represents the deity. These are all... Uh, basically different Egyptian gods. I like to use them as the example because in Egypt, they had a god for everything. I mean, they had a god for the dung beetle, for crying out loud. So, I mean, they worshipped it all. I mean, they just covered the whole gamut. And that's what Israel had to come out of. And that's interesting because when you think about the law that God gives to Israel, it's very much concerned about idolatry. There's more about idolatry than immorality. Why? Because immorality is a product of idolatry. The immoral sinner is immoral because he's practicing idolatry. So idolatry is a huge problem. And that's what the law combats for Israel. Idolatry produces the immorality that leads to the destruction of a culture, which we're about to see in Romans chapter 1. The handing over, the turning over. Idolatry uh, is something that even believers are susceptible to. That's what Paul says in Colossians. If you're practicing these deeds of the flesh, that's, that amounts to idolatry. And this is what the wrath of God comes upon. And so even as believers, we are susceptible to this. We have to guard against it. And the way you're going to guard against idolatry, as Craig said, you've got to be in the Word of God. You've got to be studying the Scriptures. That is what guards our hearts and our minds. The peace of God that transcends our understanding garrisons us so that we can take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and not fall into that idolatrous system. And so this is a huge problem even for the believer. And we have to be aware of that. Now let's go back to Romans chapter 1. So we have the futility of the mind. And now we have the pride. Man calls his speculations wisdom. But in reality, his thinking is foolishness. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And God is going to, uh, exp- to uh, blow up the foolishness of the world. He's going to show the foolishness of it. And we're going to look at a passage here in a moment in the Old Testament that uh, does it for us. So man calls his speculations wisdom, speculating that life begins on the back of Crystal's hamburgers. I don't think he meant that, but that's how I took it, because that's the only type of crystals I ever see. 
But uh, I mean, it's just it's just as much foolishness as that as it would be on the back of a crystal. See, that's the idea. We laugh at crystal hamburgers, but people believe that other junk. Why? Because they've rejected the truth. They think it's wise to talk about this, but the Bible calls them foolish. And we're told as believers to walk as wise men, not as unwise men, understanding what the will of the Lord is. And so we don't want to fall into what the world is professing to be the truth. We would fall into being foolish along with them. Distortion. In man's attempt to hide from God, he purposely distorts the truth. Think about it for a moment in Genesis. When we're in the garden there and the woman is deceived, the man ought to have picked up the serpent and played lasso with him on out of the garden, but he didn't. And the woman takes the, uh, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, eats the fruit and gives to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of the, both of them were open. They realized they were naked. They were enlightened, as the serpent had said, but not in the way he said. And now they knew something they didn't know before, apart from God, though. And they tried to solve that problem with the fig leaves and cover themselves, making their fig leaf clothing. But the moment the Lord God walked into the garden, they knew that didn't work. And what did he do? He went and hid. All of a sudden, his theology has changed. Before he ate the fruit, he knew God was omniscient, omnipresent, all-knowing. And now he thinks he can hide from God under this bush. He's perverted an understanding of God, right? I mean, just that quick. This is what we do. In our foolish thinking, we pervert and distort the truth in our attempt to hide from God. Perversion. Man perverts his responsibility toward God and creates God's he can manipulate and control. And this can even happen within Christianity. Certain theological systems that are built on philosophy and logic rather than exegesis analysis of the Scripture they create a God they can manipulate and control, all in the name of Jesus. This is a huge problem because that's sometimes very hard to discern. But in the unbeliever sense, what man does in attempting to have a God that he can meet the standard of. See, what happens when, when, man, when God is demoted and is no longer absolute holiness, man all of a sudden gets a promotion. Man promotes himself to God when he does this because he now makes himself on a way in which he can get to God on his own. Whatever that God may be that he's constructed in his mind and made an image of, this is something he's trying to do, manipulate and control things, and it's not going to work. Let's talk about these things, the futility, the pride, and distortion, and perversion from the original time this happens in human history. Let's go to Genesis, uh, or let's start with Ephesians 5, 6. First, in Ephesians 5, 6, again, we're in that application section. And Paul gives a, a little bit of an exhortation here, and he says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, words that have no value. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes. Now, we've seen before, the wrath of God comes on the idolater, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience who are deceiving with empty words. Well, where did this first happen? This first happened back in the garden. So now let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis 3, we'll, we'll start with verse uh, 1, but actually we need to look back to Genesis 2, 16 and 17 first. After God had made Adam, and then he planned the garden, put Adam in it, he tells Adam to cultivate it and keep it. And then the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. Now, pay very close attention to the wording. From any tree you may freely eat. But from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. So you can eat freely from any tree you want, there's this one tree, however, don't eat of it. The day that you eat from it, you will instantly die. You will surely die. It's a certainty that you're going to die. And what happens when he eats? He does die spiritually. He's separated from God. You have spiritual death the moment he eats. Now look at what happened. Remember the words that the Lord said to Adam. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And right there, we've got, uh, we already know something's up, that word crafty. Hmm, this, this is going to be interesting. If we'd never read the Bible before, uh, wow, a crafty thing coming along. Which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman should have said, No, that's not what he said. Get out of here. But that's not what happened. The woman said to the serpent, uh, From the fruit of the trees of the garden, uh, the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, she doesn't call it by name, but she points out the location. She knows where it is. In the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it. Now, the Lord didn't say don't touch it. Where did she get that? This is speculation. I think Adam said, Honey, just don't touch it. Just leave that thing alone. Don't even get near the thing. I don't know that, but that would make sense to me. And then she says, Or you will die. And she changes it a little bit. It's not you will certainly die. It's, you know, you will die. Now, watch this. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. Boom. Before, it was just a little bit of doubt. Now there's a flat-out challenge. God has said this. I'm saying this. Now, which one are you going to choose? Are you going to trust what God says, or are you going to buy the lie? Before she buys the lie, she rejects the truth. Right here. Every man knows God is there. That's what Paul has told us. And so he, he puts forth the challenge now, a total lie, saying you surely will not die. For God knows, and now here you've got a little bit of truth mixed in with the lie. For God knows in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open. And they were, but not in the way he's talking about. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. All right, let's analyze this just for a moment. Lie number one, you will not die. You're not going to spend eternity in a lake of fire. What kind of God would do that? Yeah, or, there's, or there's no God. There's no lake of fire. When you, when you die, that's it. Why don't you just have a good time today? Might as well. That's the immoral sinner. That's what he's doing. He's trying to drown that eternity in the heart in the immorality of the flesh. So the lie number one is you will not die. Lie number two, you will be enlightened. You're going to have knowledge beyond your understanding. You're going to have knowledge that you don't have now. And so, this is the second lie. Lie number two, you will be God. You're going to be like God when you do this. You're going to be like God by rebelling against God? Let's work that back, see? But this is the lie that's being sold. And you are now making the standard is what's happening. You're going to know enough now with your eyes open. You'll know good and evil. And you'll be able to set your standard. And what does man do with this? He calls what, is, what God says is good, he calls it evil, and he calls evil good. This is what man does in rebellion against God. He perverts the standard. And they come up with all sorts of strange stuff in the futility of their mind and the perversion of the truth, like this fellow here. You may recognize him, Mikhail Gorbachev. This is what he says about what he believes. He says, well, I believe in the cosmos. All of us are linked to the cosmos. Look at the sun. If there is no sun, then we cannot exist. So nature is my God. To me, nature is sacred. Trees are my temples and forests are my cathedrals. You know, this is his worship system. This is what he's chosen to fill the God-shaped vacuum in. We can look at a bunch of other famous people and what they've had to say about things like this, but this is just one example. This is the futility. This is the professing to be wise. They become fools in the sight of God. And the world is full of this. And the bigger problem is way too many believers buy into it at some level. And that's a huge problem. All right, let's go back to Romans now. Now it goes from bad to worse. Because not only is it bad enough that we see man rejecting the truth, suppressing it, and, ex- and, ex- and uh, buying into the lie, and exchanging the worship of the Creator as they are fools now, But now look at what happens. Therefore, verse 24, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged, note this now, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. That implies they knew the truth first. And they exchanged that in for the lie. 
and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Denial of the living God results in idolatry. They exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image. And I'd like for you to turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 10. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture in Jeremiah. And after we read through it, you'll, you'll see why. You want to talk about foolishness. You want to talk about futility. You've got it right here in this satire on idolatry. Jeremiah 10, verse 1. Hear the word which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. And that's the sad part about this. Is this is, uh, most of this is addressed to Israel, who ought to know better. Thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the nations. What's the way of the nations? Idolatry. And do not be terrified by the signs of the heavens, although the nations are terrified by them. The, sign, the, the astrological system of the ancient world. For the customs of the peoples are a delusion, because it is wood cut from the forest. The work of the hands of a craftsman with a cutting tool. They decorate it with silver and with gold. In other words, they, they take wood and they, they cut it down and they fashion a wonderful idol with it. And then they, they cover it and decorate it with all sorts of precious metals to make it shine, make it look as glorious as they can. But then look at what they have to do. They fasten it with nails and with hammers so that it will not totter. It's a bad thing when your idol falls over. Just ask the Philistines about Dagon. That's a bad day. So we're going to nail him down. It's a, it's, what kind of God do you have? You have to nail him down to make sure he doesn't fall over. Now, I love verse 5. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field are they, and they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them, for they can do no harm, nor can they do any good. What's a scarecrow for? Scare away the crows or animals. It works until the crows realize there's no life in that thing. That's what a scarecrow is. There's no life to it. There's no life in these idols. And so why are you worshiping these things? And then he shifts gears. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and great is your name and might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? Indeed, it is your due. For among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. So in contrast to these scarecrows and these idols that can fall over if we don't hammer them down, God is way far above and beyond. But they are altogether stupid and foolish. Why? In their discipline of delusion. In their ritual of idolatry, God says they're stupid and foolish. Their idol is wood. Beaten silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Ephaz. I mean, this is the best elements they can use to make their God out of. The work of a craftsman and of the hands of a goldsmith. Violet and purple are their clothing. This was expensive during the, the ancient world. But they are all the work of skilled men. In contrast, the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth quakes, and the nations cannot endure his indignation. And then you have an interesting verse, the only verse that's in, outside of uh, Daniel here, that's in Arabic, the language of the Gentiles, says, thus you shall say to them, this is directly at the Gentiles, the gods that did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. This is what the immoral sinner needs to understand, that the gods that did not make the world, they're going to perish. Only creator God is going to exist. He's the only one that exists. These things aren't gods at all. So it's wonderful satire on what we're reading here in Romans 1. God gives them over to the impurity they desire. You had three times that God gave them over to the lusts of the flesh, to their impurity. And God allows them to dishonor their own bodies. And we're going to see how that happens here in just a moment. So now in verse uh, 26, For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over. So he's going to give them over again. Romans 1, 25 through 27. 
then defilement of idol worship results in their degradation. It goes from bad to worse. God in His grace deals with them. He is long-suffering. He is patient. But eventually, the day of grace ends. The unbeliever who dies without Christ, the day of grace is over. Now it's eternal separation from God. And that's a sad thing to think about. But this is the justice of God in action. Eventually, God's grace is going, and patience is going to end on these cultures that follow this pattern. Romans 126a, so God gives them over to degrading passions. What they want in their sin nature, he gives them over to going further. And you see this. You, know, you can see this in reality TV. It keeps getting weirder and weirder because to keep the flesh entertained, it's got to go a step higher and a step higher. The flesh is never satisfied. It's always going to want more. And the more it wants, the more depraved it goes in the sense of it's already totally depraved. And that's really kind of a, uh, um, um, I forget what it's called, but it's redundant, I guess. You're already depraved. Most of the time, though, we're not acting on that complete aspect of depravity. But the more we operate in the flesh, the more the flesh wants, it just gets worse and worse and worse. It goes into a downward spiral. God calls the resulting prostitution unnatural. Women exchanging the natural function. Men the same. This is a product of idolatry. God calls the resulting homosexuality, or sodomy, indecent and destructive. It destroys a culture, destroys a nation. It first starts destroying the person. There's an interesting connection to some of the diseases that are connected to certain types of sexual sins, or all sexual sins. Now, look at Romans 1, 28 again. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer... God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They're gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. I mean, my goodness. It looks like they run for Congress, too. Verse 32, and although they know the ordinance of God, note that now, they know where God has made it evident within them. He's made it evident to them. They know the standard, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. That brings up an interesting question. What's worse, to be doing it or to give approval of those who do? By giving approval, you're just as guilty as actually having Done it yourself as far as the sin of approving sin, the idea. In Romans 1, 28 through 31, their disavowal of their knowledge of God results in atheism. They did not see fit to acknowledge God. So God gave them over. So God gives them over to depraved minds. God gives them over to depraved minds. So they multiply their degradation through innumerable sins, and you have the list there. I mean, we have these types of things happening in this nation at the highest level. We just had an example of this come to light in the last week. Why is it happening at the highest level? Because the nation as a whole doing the same thing. We can't expect anything different from the leaders. We get leaders that reflect what's going on in the culture. We shouldn't be surprised when the world does what the Bible says the world's going to do. What's sad is when believers do what the world does. Now that, that's what causes a greater heartache. Romans 1.32, their defiance of God and their flirtation with death result in reprobation. Results in reprobation. They continue to practice these things and give hearty approval. They know that their actions deserve death. They personally dare God. And they encourage others to defy God. Death, dare, and defy. And I think one of the greatest examples where we're going to see this in history 
is going to be during that most difficult time, the Lord says, on planet Earth, the time of Jacob's trouble. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation 6, 15 through 17. We're coming in the section here with the seal judgments. And note the attitude of the people. Let's start at verse 15. I mean, things are happening. War and all sorts of, of famine and death and all sorts of things are going on on the planet. Then verse 15 says, The kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks and the mountains. Why? They said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne. That's the Father in Revelation. They know where this is coming from. And from the wrath of the Lamb. So this is the wrath of God that they're aware of. What do they want to do? Do they want to turn and submit to God? No, they want the rocks to fall on them and kill them off. They will do anything but to recognize God as creator. This is man at his worst right here. Now what are we to do in situations like this? What they need is the message of the gospel very quickly. Of course, we have to have that creator-creature distinction. But remember what the Bible teaches, that all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. The world had sinned there. But the Son, we have the Trinity up here, and we have the separation of the world from, from God. Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus Christ was willing to take on a human nature to his person and come and be obedient to the Father's plan to the point of death, even death on a cross. So he came and he went to the cross and we know from 2 Corinthians 5.21 that God the Father, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us. God took the sin and, and judged it in the person of Christ during those three hours on the cross. Jesus Christ is the mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus Christ, through whom there is no other access to the Father. That's the one exit ramp you can take off the three roads that's the only exit ramp that you can take this is the message that we have as ambassadors that Jesus Christ has died for your sins he has paid it all all you have to do is simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved the one who believes in the son will have life the one who does not believe in the son does not have life but the wrath of God abides on him he, he was born and he died according to the scriptures. He was resurrected according to the scriptures. And he did all that with you in mind, with everyone in mind. And blessed is the man whom God does not hold his transgressions against him. Note that sin is here. It's no, not here any longer. Sin's not the problem. The problem is not believing in Christ. The reason sin's not the problem is because Christ has paid it all in full, left the tip, there's nothing we can add to it. It is absolute grace. And when a person comes along by, and by faith, and remember, faith comes from hearing. Hearing what? The message of the gospel preached. Faith, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. A person comes along and believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is then declared righteous and justified before God. That's what people need to hear, that the immoral sinner, the religious sinner, the moral sinner, this is the message that has to be made clear. And that's my time. Let's, uh, let's, let's close in prayer since it's about time to stop. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, what a, what a privilege it is to just be able to open your word and to read it and study it and have the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit to help us in understanding these things. May what we've seen here in Romans 1 be a wake-up call to us and the fact that even as believers we are susceptible to making the wrong decisions. And sin what? Yeah, I know, we're going to have to, we're gonna have to <laughs> definitely produce that. Definitely.
Okay, well, we're ready to get rolling again this afternoon, and we're going to continue on where we left off. But just by way of review, uh, as you'll recall, if I can get the TV on here, or the monitor, and get this going here. We are looking at uh, three types of sinners. And the first type that we saw last hour was found in Romans 1, 18 through 32. And this type of sinner is the immoral sinner. They're easy to, uh, it's interesting that the Apostle Paul started with the immoral sinner because it's easy to spot an immoral sinner. In fact, our tendency is to spot them and condemn them, judge them, and say, yes, they are worthy of hell and God should send them to hell. But then the Apostle Paul, as it were, turns the gun uh, and away from the immoral sinner to the moral man, to the moral person, the moral individual. And he's going to prove to us beyond a shadow of a doubt, in my mind, <laughs> and I hope in your mind when this is all done, that the moral man, the, the moral sinner is also worthy of God's judgment. And if we don't understand that that is the argument that Paul is laying out here, then you misapply these scriptures. You'll begin to teach that Romans chapter 2 says, do not judge. Do not, um, to, and, and you might apply that to a Christian. This is not what this scripture is about. This is a, this is a legal argument. Paul, as a good lawyer here, is taking people from one argument to the next and showing, uh, as it were, there's a three-legged stand that, that humanity tries to stand on or sit on, and one of the legs is um, immorality, and another is morality, and another is uh, religion. And he's going to knock all three legs out from under that stool and leave everyone in the same place in the end. We'll get to Romans chapter nine verses, I mean, 3, verses 9 through uh, 20. And we will see the conclusion that he comes to. And so we will begin now in this section to look at the moral center. How does God view um, moral people? Does he view them as we do? With a pat on the back and attaboy, good job. Or does he see that even our righteousnesses are like filthy rags? And the Bible would say he sees that our righteousnesses as... Uh, Isaiah 64, 6 says, are like filthy rags to him. Let's begin by reading the scriptures. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Therefore you are without excuse, every man of you who passes judgment. For in that you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. And do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment upon those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubborn and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to every man who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For not, all, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. 
For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we have just heard your word read. Father, we have um, before us a challenge to understand this passage. A challenge which um, really is not a human challenge, but is a divine challenge. Because this is your word. This is your work. One plants and other waters but it is God that gives the increase uh, this is your um, your truth Lord that you have given to mankind and so in order to understand it properly Lord we stand in need of your provision we stand in your need of in need of your teaching and we thank you that when he the spirit of truth was to come he was to guide us all into truth and so we thank you for the truth that we find here and we pray dear God that you would uh, apply this truth to our lives in an understandable way take um, take full control of of this time together in Jesus name we pray amen now we're going to begin to look at these pa these verses 1 through 16 of chapter 2 and we're going to see God's condemnation and how it rightly falls on the moral sinner we're going to see the culpability first of all of the moral sinner Look at verse 1 again of chapter 2. Therefore you are without excuse, who? Every man of you who passes judgment. So the, uh, this portion is written to not believers. Rather, this is written to unbelievers, moral people. You see how he says there, you are without excuse, every man of you. He's talking about the non-believer here who is passing judgment on immoral people. I'm better than they are. Who do they think? that I know they, they deserve hell. But what about the, the moral sinner himself? What is he like before God? Well, the Bible says in verse 1, let's read it again. Therefore, you are without excuse. God says you're inexcusable, even you. Even if you're moral. Even if you don't practice what the evil people of chapter 1 practice, you yourself are without excuse. And he's going to explain why he, he says that. God says that when, a moral sinner, when moral sinners do the same things they accuse others of doing, they actually condemn themselves. That's what he's saying there. Therefore, you are without excuse. Every man of you who passes judgment, for in that you judge another, you condemn yourself. And so it's kind of like you remember your mom back when you were little and, and they would tell you, don't point at people. When you point at people, you got three fingers pointing back at you, you know, and, and, uh, and really that's what God is saying here. The moment you say, those immoral people, y you are condemning yourself because even if you haven't done the exact thing that they've done, you do things that are equally evil. And if you say they are worthy of judgment, you are saying, I am worthy of judgment. Because by virtue of the fact that you know right and wrong, and you know that it's wrong to do the things they're doing, you are saying, I deserve judgment because I do similar type of types of things. Let's look at the correctness of God's judgments against the moral sinner. God always judges properly. God's judgment rightly falls on those who practice the same things. Look at verse 1 again. He says, you condemn yourself for you who judge practice the same, same things. Verse 2, and we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. And they would. As they looked at the immoral sinner and they would say, these are a bunch of liars. And in doing that, they, they're right. God's judgment should fall on, on liars. Uh, in fact, when you look at who will uh, spend eternity outside of heaven, 
the one uh, part of those who spend eternity outside of heaven, according to Revelation, it is those who are liars and all liars. Drunkards are listed in that same list with liars. And so God always judges properly. And when you judge someone else, you and you practice the same thing, you are condemning yourself. God's judgment is inescapable. Do you think you will escape the judgment of God? Verse 3. Or do you suppose this, again, he's reminding us that it, he's talking to the non-believer when he says that little phrase, O oh man. Do you suppose this, in verse 3, O oh man, when you pass judgment upon those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? And what's the answer to that rhetorical question? The answer is, you will not escape it. So why are you trying to fool yourself? And the truth is, is we all do the same types of sins. So now he's going to begin to give corroborating arguments for the legitimacy of God's judgment against the moral sinner. Now, one thing you have to understand in this passage that Paul is speaking uh, from a judicial level. He has God with the, the, the judge's mantle on him. Um, the, um, do you have the, the black uh, hand? And also, did you happen to get a gavel? <laughs> I need my gavel. I feel good with that, you know? Bring a little judgment on the situation here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. You know, um, you want to put this on me real quick there? Just. <laughs> now, I in order to understand this passage, you need to understand the fact that God is talking from a judicial sense. He's going to show us that he is a just God. And he's actually going to show us in this passage that if there is ever found a person who wanted to gain eternal life through their good works, and they actually did it, persevered all of their life in doing good works, he would never lift his gavel and declare them guilty. I mean, he only sends people who are worthy of, of, of hell to hell. And if a person has lived their whole life, never did anything wrong, and, and they did so so that they would gain eternal life, he would, and, they, and they actually accomplished that, he would say, come on down. Let's everybody give this individual here a big hand of applause. Lived all of his life without sin. Deserves heaven. And he accomplished it. Let's, let's give him eternal life. And he would do it. You know, but you know why it is? Because, because God is a just God. He would never con condemn someone to hell if they didn't deserve it. What Romans chapter 2 is going to say, though, is, is there anyone like that? He's already said, if you, if you point your finger and judge someone and you do the same thing, you've just killed yourself. You've just condemned yourself. And so this is the truth. Who do you know out there that has never sinned? Who, have you ever met anyone that has never sinned? I remember a pastor friend of mine was talking to a lady who was a pastor in a, in a denominational church out there, and, and she said, I haven't sinned for 20 years. And he was like, shocked. You know, and he said, wow, that's amazing. And, and uh, he said, for 20 years? Yes, for 20 years I haven't sinned. And he said, I bet you're proud of that. And she said, I sure am. <laughs> he ruined a 20-year <laughs> stint. <laughs> So, um, you know, it's if you, yeah, if you redefine sin, I could probably be a pretty good person myself. If I could decide, de define sin my way and decide what's right and wrong instead of allowing the word of God to make that call, I could probably be better than a lot of people, but not before God because God knows everything I've done from the day I was born until the day I die, because God is a perfect judge who is not only perfect, who, has, who, who knows no secret. 
I mean, the, he, there's nothing, uh, who, who doesn't know every secret. In other words, there's nothing hidden from his eyes. Everything is laid bare before God. And he knows everything you have ever done. Every day of your life, he's seen you in those alone, alone times. He's seen you in those secret moments. He's seen the thoughts of your heart. When no one else could see, he knows everything. You know something else about God? He's got a very good memory. He's got a very good memory. So if you're going to go to heaven trying to argue your own case and get into heaven on your own merits, you better have lived a very, very perfect life. Because if you failed anywhere, it'll be shown on that day. And the truth is, is most of us sin several times a day. But let's say you only sinned once a day. That would mean in a year you'd only sin 365 times. In a year, that would, in 10 years, that would only mean you'd have 6,650, uh, I mean 3,650 sins. If you live to be 50 years of age, someone get the calculator out. <laughs> in other words, we got a lot to reckon with. And you know what? Most of us have sinned more than once a day on average through our attitudes, through our thoughts, through our actions. Wow, what do we deserve? We deserve the judge, that perfect judge of the universe to declare us guilty as charged. That's what we deserve. But if you want to go on your own, God will give you your day in court. It's called the great white throne judgment. You know what's going to happen there? The books will be open, the Bible says. Not just book, and that's because it takes a lot of books to write down all the sins and stuff we've done. The books will be opened. And your life will be examined from the books. And so you can either have your day in court, or you can allow God to make you right with himself through a whole different way. And there's a really good news that God makes people right with himself by faith, by faith in the one who paid our penalty for us, Jesus Christ, who died for us and rose again. So you have your choice. And so let's begin to unpackage these verses. Look at verse 4 again. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance, to a change of mind? Just because God is not presently judging doesn't mean that he will not judge sin or that he is lenient with sin. He is just patient. He is patiently waiting. You know why he's patient? Because he's hoping that sinners will find that exit route. Jesus Christ. He wants to, he's giving them opportunity to hear the gospel and to believe. And he's patiently working with them. Very few of us believe the first time we hear the gospel. In fact, there was a study that said most people need to hear the gospel. I think it's 6.7 times. And I don't know how they got the point seven, But it, uh, in other words, you need to hear it probably six or seven times. Uh, the average person you witness to. And so you might be number five when you witness to someone. You know, you might be number eight with someone else. But... The average number of times to be witnessed to is about six or seven times. And I, 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 would, I don't know the details of that study, but it's probably viable. God is not judging people yet because he, has, he patiently waits for them to change their minds about their sinfulness, about their, the, the fact that they are worthy of death, that they have broken God's rules that their good works are dead works. And he wants them to understand that. He wants them to change their mind about Jesus Christ. Moral sinners are storing up more justifiable judgment because of their unrepentant hearts in the face of God's patience. Verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves. In the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now, who is he talking to here? He's talking to moral people. 
that person that would point their finger at the immoral people of chapter 1 and judge them and say, I'm not like that. I, I'm not immoral. I'm good. I've raised my family well. I do my job. I pay my taxes. Those people who are judging the rest of the world, the Lord says this, you're really storing up wrath for yourself on that day. Because every time you judge someone else, you prove that you know right from wrong. In other words, if I say, if I say to you, you lied, and in three weeks from now, I lie, man, I, I'm, I'm dead meat, so to speak, as we used to say growing up. I have no hope. Because I already proved three weeks ago that I know it's wrong to lie. When I told you, you lied to me. And so when I lie, someone picks up the phone. Um, my wife picks up, tell them I'm not here. You know? That's a lie if I do that. And so if I do that after I called you a liar, I have just totally put it down. They'll mark it in the books and put a star by it. I don't know, the angels maybe write the books. Uh, whoever it is. And it will be obvious. Paul argues that God as a completely righteous judge, gives all people exactly what they deserve, nothing more and nothing less. Look at verse 6. And this is a quote from the Old Testament. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. You see, this is something that we must understand about this perfect judge that God is. God, as a perfect judge, gives to man according to their deeds, unless... Unless that man has been declared to be right with God through faith. You remember Abraham? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. By faith, Abraham became a righteous man. And that's how people always become righteous before God. Because they trust in God in his provision. And in trusting in God's provision... God declares them to be right with himself based on something that was done for them. And that was the righteous Lord Jesus died for us unrighteous people. Based on the merits and the worth and the value of Jesus' death for us, God can now declare you to be right with himself. Verse 7. I want you to understand that God is fair. To, to those who by perseverance, now underline the word perseverance in your Bible if, you, if you're a person who writes in your Bible, because that is an interpretive key to this verse. To those who by perseverance in doing good, what are they seeking for? They seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give them eternal life. He will give to eternal life. He will give eternal life because he's a righteous judge. He will give eternal life to anyone who perseveres in doing good if they're doing so in order to gain glory, honor, and immortality. He's not an unrighteous judge. He would never send someone to hell if they didn't deserve it. And, you know, I think there are people that are dead today that are actually in hell, and they're thinking, I'm here unjustly. I was a nice person. I did good to people. And that's why later on God's going to bring them up and allow them to have their day in court at the great white throne judgment, to allow them to argue their case. But then he's going to open the books. And he can prove from the life of every human being that they deserve hell. He can prove it without a, a, a shadow of a doubt. And even at that judgment, he says, but let's have one last look at a special book over here, the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, just to see if their names are written in there. Now, anyone that is being judged at the great white, white throne judgment doesn't have their name in the book of life. But he still, because he's a just God, he lets that book be consulted just to prove as a just judge without circumventing justice, without s getting something out from under the table, 
some bribe or something. He lets everything have its day in court. Now, thankfully, those of us who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, our day in court was 2,000 years ago when Jesus paid our sin penalty for us. And God accepts his death in the place of our death. And, and God accepts his, uh, what he did for us in our place. And this is very, very good news for us who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's good news for all of humanity because that is offered to everyone equally. So let's read verse 7 again. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, and the equal sign would be eternal life. Look at verse 10 again. But glory, honor, and peace to every man who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And you know, that's what God would do. If there was someone that did good, and persevered in their whole life in doing good, he would bring that person up into the front of, the, of heaven and he would say, let's give this guy glory. Let's give him honor. Let's give him the, the, what he deserves. Everyone, let's give him a big round of applause. Because that's the kind of justice we have in God's system. The thing is, is, is there anyone righteous? There's none righteous, no, not one. And we'll see that in a second. And so, but I hope you're understanding the argument, the legal argument the, uh, that the Apostle Paul is laying out here. Now, the question is, is there anyone in this category? Well, let's flip over to Romans chapter 3, and I'll give you a heads up on what's coming. Romans 3, 10 through, through um, 12, it says, it is written. Now, he's not, he's not writing this himself. He's getting it out of the Old Testament scriptures. There is none righteous. Not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned, uh, turned aside. Together they became or become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Okay? So you have to understand Romans chapter 2 in light of this Romans chapter 3 passage. It's very critical. In fact, let's look at Romans 3.23 in the same passage. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, there's no one like that. But if there was, God would, be, God would let them have their way in. Isaiah 64.6 says, Humankind has a double-edged problem of being sinners on the one hand, on the one side of the coin, and on the other side of the coin, having good works that look like filthy rags. The very best thing that you can produce as a human being in the eyes of a perfect God is a filthy rag. You know, when our kids are little and they draw a picture and we get that picture and, and we hang it on the fridge and we tell everybody, my son draw, drew this, but it's some stick figure, you know. <laughs> and and uh, But we, we, give them a, we give them a pass, you know, because they're just a little kid. But, you know, in, in the eyes of a perfect God, the best artist in the world makes stick figures. That's the best they can do. Our, our righteousness is like filthy rags to, to the eyes of a perfect God. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, There is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. But there is a righteous judge that if someone was like that, he would give them the honor they deserve. He'd say, you deserve eternal life. Come down. Let's give this person a big round of applause. That's what Romans chapter 2 is saying. But there's another side to that argument as well. We have to see that coming up here. Now let's look at verses 8 and 9. 2, 8 says this. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, what do they have? What's their equal sign? Wrath and indignation. Now, that describes all of us. There will be tribulation and distress, verse 9, for every soul who does evil, doesn't matter if they're a Jew or Gentile or Greek, of the Jews first and also of the Greek. 
Now he's writing to Greek uh, to Greek speaking people in Rome. Greek was the the elite culture of the day, so to speak. He says, "Anyone he will punish anyone who does evil with wrath and indignation." And so that's the flip side of this argument. As a righteous judge, if someone deserved eternal life, give him eternal life. Perfect, live perfectly, never sinned. But on the, same, on the same side, anyone who does evil, he will give them wrath and indignation because God is a perfect judge. God is not going to uh, subvert justice for anyone. And so if you're going to get to heaven on your good works, you're going to have to find a time machine. You're going to have to go back to your childhood. And you're going to have to relive your whole life in absolute perfection all the way until you die. I remember my part, uh, not my partner, but a guy that was working with the Yanomamo in another base, uh, Dave, uh, Bobby Jank. Uh, he was teaching on the Ten Commandments, and the, the Yanomamo there said, well, if we would have known about the Ten Commandments, we would have kept them. We, would, we could keep these. And so he said, well, I'll tell you what, let's just do, a, let's just do something. You guys try over the weekend to keep the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and, uh, and then we'll talk about it on Monday. So it was like on a Friday. By Monday, they were all, every one of them, hanging their heads. Not one of them made it through the weekend. And, and none of us have ever made it. None of us can make it. And so we need a righteousness apart from what we can do with these hands and this mind. And this body and this person. We need a righteousness that God gives to us as a free gift. We need a righteousness that is perfect, a righteousness that God can accept. And the only person that can give that kind of righteousness is God Himself. And He does so through a person, Jesus Christ. And if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are taken away and His righteousness is given to you. And, of course, he's already paid for your sins 2,000 years ago. We must understand that the entire world is worthy of punishment. Romans 3, 9 says this. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. No exception. All of us are under sin. So if you're going to get to heaven by your good works, it's too late for you. You should have started when you were still in your mother's womb. You should have come out saying, I'm going to be good, and I'm going to do it all the way through. And it's too late. We must understand that one sin makes us guilty of breaking all of God's laws. Someone might say, but, but I want to, you know, I will, um, I'll try to be good. I'll try to be good from now on. I'll, I'll never, ever sin anymore. We'll look at James 2.10. It says this, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he became guilty of all. Keep the whole law, stumble at one point, you're guilty of all. It's kind of like the guy that, that lives a pretty good life all his life and and uh, he has a fence between him and his neighbor's house, and they're always arguing a little bit about where the fence line is. And one day he wakes up in the morning, hears some noise outside, goes outside, and sees his neighbor moving the fence over two feet into his yard. Oh, he gets angry. They begin to, they begin to get mad at each other, and finally the guy goes in the house and comes out with a gun and kills his neighbor. Bam. Neighbor's dead. They come, the police come and get the guy. The guy says, what are you doing with me? I, I mean, why are you taking me into jail? What are you taking me in for? Well, because you killed your neighbor. Yeah, but I, I've helped people all of my life. I've been good to my, my neighbors. I, I've, I've, I've raised my children. I go to church. I, I'm a good citizen. I pay my taxes. I've, I've done so many good things. And his one bad thing would take it all away, wouldn't it? Now, we think that murder, yeah, deserves that. But we would never think lying one time would deserve that, unless you're Richard Nixon. 
uh, you know, we we have a very warped idea. And God is a perfect judge. You sin, you you deserve death. Sin once, you deserve it already. And of course, we've all sinned. And I'm not even talking here, and nor is Paul arguing here about the fact that we were born with the the unrighteousness of Adam, the sin of Adam imputed to us. He's just taking each individual as a test, uh, as a as an individual uh, person, and giving them an opportunity. So let's move forward. The judgment of God is impartial. Look at verse eleven. In case you've thought maybe. I'm making something up here. <laughs> the whole argument is this, verse 11, for there is no partiality with God. You see, God is, is going to judge everybody, and if someone deserves eternal life because they've been persevering and doing what's right, man, he's not going to send them to hell if they don't deserve it. But the, pr- the truth is, is every person can be proved to be deserving of hell. But God is an impartial judge. And so he would never do it unless you deserve it. God judges according to our understanding, verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. In other words, that means that um, when we went to live in, in Venezuela, we went to, the, to live in the Amazon, we went up to... Uh, the, the state of, uh, ter- it was a territory of Am- Amazonas, Amazon territory in Venezuela at the time. To get to our mission station, you had to um, get in an airplane and fly two and a half hours, 140 miles an hour pro- approximately, into the jungle. We, we lived in the heart of the Amazon jungle, basically, because you could leave our base and in about two and a half hours, you could be in Boa Vista, uh, you could be two and a half hours into another to, to Puerto Ayacucho, Venezuela, and you could go in other directions. In about two and a half hours, you would reach a city. So we were as about as far out in the Amazon that you could be away from civilization. And the Yanomamo people lived there on the tops of the Sierra Barima Mountains. And when, when we got there, um, they had been living there for centuries. We don't know how long they've lived there. And one of the things that they they do is they grow gardens. They have gardens that they have a slash and burn method where, um, where they'll cut down trees and, br- and, and then cut the fell big trees on top of that. And when it dries out, they'll burn it and plant there. Before they had axes, the, the way, what they would do is go out in the woods and find a big tree that had been blown over by the wind. And then they would go over and break off trees, small trees around. And like I said the other day, they'll actually get on the ground and chew the tree until they can uh, spit out the bark, until they can break it off. And uh, they'll break these limbs down and let it dry, start a fire, burn it up. It leaves a hole in the woods. And in fact, their gardens are called Fikari Tucka. A tucka is a hole in their language. So it's this, this garden hole in the woods. And there they plant bananas, they plant corn, they plant several root crops. And they will plant and then they will go away to the jungle and live on honey and other other products from the jungle until their gardens grow up when their gardens grow up they come back and they're nomad uh, they're they're uh, sedentary as long as they have gardens when they don't have gardens anymore then they become nomadics and so um, they had a they have a word in their language they have an animal first of all his name is a toma a toma is an, a little rat that was well, not too little he's a pretty good sized rat that lives in the jungle uh, I call him a rat. I don't know. It's, a, it's basically an oversized rat. And the Toma goes into their gardens when they're out in the woods, and he'll eat roots. He'll do, he'll do a lot of damage. Now, they eat Toma, too, so if they catch him, they'll kill him and eat him. But in the meantime, this thing can do a lot of damage. And uh, sometimes you think, man, tomorrow I'm going to go harvest my sweet potatoes. And you get out to the garden, and the night before, the Toma had got in there and eaten them. So they came up with a word. Um, they can make a, a, a noun into a verb by adding the word mo on the end of it. So toma, mo, becomes a verb. And that's their word for to steal. And so before missionaries ever got to their tribe, before missionaries ever taught the word of God, they had a word for to steal, tomo mo. And they knew it was bad. 
In fact, if some Yanomamo had a stock of bananas and one of their neighbors went into their garden and stole their banana stock, they would come back to the village and begin to yell, Who stole? Who stole? And, uh, and they knew that it was wrong to steal. Now, who taught them to do that, that it was wrong to steal? They didn't have the Bible. As far as they knew, you know, I, they did come off the ark with us. They had the truth at one point. Um, but they didn't have the written word of God. But they know what tomomo is. They have another word called hoashimo. And that is monkey is hoashi. And mo is to do the monkey thing. And that's called monkey and around. It's called immorality. And so they have a word for immorality. They have the same words that we have. They even have a word for to covet. Bufi wayo. Uh, that means I reject my own heart. That means to desire something else. Uh, for some reason, they kind of turn it around. I, I'm rejecting myself because I'm desiring what you have. So um, they had all these words and all this understanding. Who gave them that? Well, it's written in their hearts. So when God judges them someday, will he pull out the Ten Commandments to judge Yanomamu? No, he's going to judge them based on what they knew. That's what my Bible says right here in Romans 2.12, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. So they're not going to make it to heaven because the crazy thing about the Yanomamo is even though they know it's wrong to Tomomo, I've never met a Yanomamo that doesn't Tomomo. In fact, I had to pretty much keep everything under wraps all the time. I went on a trip with them one time. I had some candy, put it in my backpack real deep in there, and I my, my partner said, bring candy because when you get really tired, pull out a candy, throw it in your mouth. It'll give you a little bit of boost of energy. And we were going over some pretty treacherous mountains. So I've got this candy, and I started reaching in my backpack and pulling one out. And I, I, every now and then, I'd get one that was just soggy. Yeah. You know, it was just soggy. And, and, and I would think, okay, well, I guess the humidity from the jungles getting this thing soggy. And, uh, and then I would get another one and be rock hard. And I was like, this is crazy. Until one night I was sitting at a campfire and I looked over at Samson. This guy, this guy had one eye. His name was Sanson. He had a big old grin on his mouth when I threw a candy in my mouth. Because that joker had been taking my candy and sucking it halfway, spitting it back in the wrapper and putting it back in the bag. <laughs> uh, and so anyway, they know what Tomomo is. Of course, he wasn't really Tomomo because he left me some of it. <laughs> it's like eating an apple and leaving the core for somebody. So anyway, if I have bad breath, you know why. <laughs> All who sin without the Ten Commandments perish without the Ten Commandments. All who sin without the Ten Commandments perish without the Ten Commandments. All who sin with the Ten Commandments are judged by the commandments. Nobody gets off the hook. And by the way, I've been eating candies in that room over there. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'll let you guess which ones. Okay. Verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Now, is he saying here that you will that people can actually be justified by keeping the law? Yes and no. What would you have to do to be a doer of the law? You would have to be perfect. And I haven't met such a folk, a person yet, and I don't. I doubt that you have either. Knowing the law does not justify you. That's what he's saying there. You have to keep it. If you're going to justify yourself by keeping the law, you're going to have to keep it perfectly every day of your life until the day you die. And if you've already messed up, you've already messed up. It's too late for you. You've got to figure out a different way. But if you've been able to make it to this point perfectly without ever sinning, you still have a chance. You still have hope. But I wouldn't depend on that. There's a better way. You're going to see a better way to be made right with God, apart from the law. 
To be justified on his own, a man would have to be a perfect doer of the law every day of his life. Perfect. Verse 13. Not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. To be justified on his own, a man would have to be a perfect doer of the law. Anybody like that in here? Raise your hand. We want to give you an applause to this point. Okay. You must remember this important phrase from Romans 2.7. By perseverance in doing good. Look at verse 7 up there. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. He'll give them eternal life if they persevere. There's a better way. To be justified by keeping God's laws, he or she would need to be perfect every moment of his or her life. Let's read verse 16 of the same chapter. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through, G through Christ Jesus. So there's coming a day when God would judge even the secrets of man. And that man would have to be perfect. But let's look over to chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. For those who believe they could make it by keeping the law, the Bible says this, verse 19. And we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And so you could never be justified in God's sight by keeping the law. You would have to be perfect. Romans 2, 14 through 16 says this. God judges correctly. Anything you ever have thought or done will be used against you on judgment day. That's God's Miranda rights for you who know that law. Back to chapter 2, verse 14. Let's read 14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law for themselves. What does that mean? When the Yanomamo out there tells his son, Tomomodiha, don't steal. When he says that, he is establishing a law for himself. He is becoming a law for himself. That's what God is saying here in verse 14. And in any way, his laws are written upon our consciences, aren't they? We know right and wrong without having to even really be taught because we still have the vestiges of the image of God imprinted upon us. When people who do not have the Ten Commandments instinct instinctively do them, they become a law to themselves. A law to themselves. Verse 14 again says this, For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves. In other words, God writes it down. Hey, angels, put that in the books. This one over here knows the difference between stealing and not stealing. You see him down there? He's yelling because someone stole his bananas, and he's mad about someone having stolen his bananas in the garden. Write it down that Joe over there understands that it's, that it's wrong to steal because uh, Joe uh, also steals. Verse 15, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. When people who do not have the law, the Ten Commandments, instinctively do them, they prove that they have the law written on their hearts and cannot plead ignorance to sin. You know that every person on this earth has a conscience. And do you know that every person's conscience is sitting up on their shoulder with either a pitchfork in its hand or, or a, a, a attaboy? And everything they do, that conscience says, good job, you know, or you jerk, you total jerk. 
And that, ju- and that conscience is back and forth all day long, telling them good, bad, good, bad. And, uh, of course, you can warp that, you know. Uh, that conscience can become extremely warped, but it still does that. Whatever level it's at, it's either, good job, or, you jerk. And so we have the law written on our hearts, even people who do not have the law. For this reason, the, the natives are, not, are, are without excuse because God's not going to judge them based on the law, but he's going to judge them based on the fact that they had nature preaching to them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, shouting forth, there is a God. He's going to, the God is going to point out the fact that you knew right and wrong and you still did wrong. He's going to use their own particular context to prove that they are sinners. And those of us who have this, wow, even harsher judgment. If you have it in stone, written, etched in, 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 in paper, black and white, where you can read it, you have even less excuse. And so we have even a greater reason uh, for him to judge us. He'll judge us out of the law. He'll judge them out of their conscience. But no one will be found not guilty. People's conscience, consciences become their constant judge, either accusing or acquitting them. Verse 15, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. Accusing or defending. So, verse 16. One day, God will reveal people's secrets and condemn them by their understanding of right and wrong according to their consciences. Verse 16. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. The gospel says... It, the gospel says this. You can be free from condemnation. And you can have eternal life as a free gift. But if you, re- re- but if you reject the free gift, you remain in condemnation. And you will be judged. That's what the gospel says. And so Paul, his gospel said, you can have eternal life. As a free gift, you can be made right with God, or you can take your chances and stand in court someday and defend your own case. You can either have God raise his gavel, not guilty to you, or you can stand someday and argue your case based on your merits and on your goodness and see how you have, what kind of outcome you have. But one thing is for sure, there will be no one found not guilty at the great white throne's judgment. This is why you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to escape the great white throne judgment day, to have your sins forgiven, to be given the free gift of eternal life found in Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a much better and a much safer way to go. People will be judged and condemned by their own words and actions even if they never knew the Ten Commandments. People will be judged and condemned by their own words and actions, even if they never knew the Ten Commandments. Where do I get that from? Verse 16, On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. So let's look and see where we're at so far on this outline. We've seen the gospel, this introduction to the gospel of grace. Paul in chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, said he was accountable for the gospel. And he described that gospel, being the gospel of God. Then he talked about the people that he was addressing, the Romans. And and he told them, you need grace and peace. And you are the called, the beloved of God, saints. We see Paul's aspirations in the gospel. He wanted to get to Rome. He wanted to even preach to Roman Christians the gospel. Just as we're going we're to we're teach you the gospel again during this workshop. Uh, because even if you understand the gospel already, you just need to hear it over and over again. We're never too big for the gospel. And then we have this great acclamation at the end where he says, 
that anyone salvation is the uh, that 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 the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. Then we have chapter two, uh, chapter one, verses eighteen and forward, where he begins to introduce the three types of sinners, and we've already seen the immoral sinner this morning. And now we've just seen the moral sinner, and now we're going to move on to see the religious sinner, and we'll be examining that shortly. The religious sinner. And this one gets tricky in a sense, although it's straightforward when you look at it. So what we're going to do now is just take a couple of minutes and open it up for questions on this section. Is there any question or any uh, thought or comment that anyone might have? Clear as mud? Yes. Right, they will not be, because our sin, those who believe on the Lord Jesus, three sixteen says, "For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever." believes in him should not perish that means go to judge go to hell but have eternal life for god did not send the son into the world to judge the world but that the world through him should be saved uh should be saved through him and it was saved from what saved from impending judgment look at verse 18 he who believes in him is not judged or condemned you won't be judged if you believe in him he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And what he means is they're already under condemnation. Their judgment is sure. They're already, uh, they're, they're on the docket waiting for their day in court down the road. Now you can get off the docket uh, by believing. And that's... Look at verse 19. And this is the judgment that light came into the, is come into the world. But men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who hates evil, um, uh, it, everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. And so the person who comes to the light, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, his, um, he does not fall under the condemnation of God. And uh, his judgment is passed for him already. Any other comments? Yes. Is, um, and forgive me for not understanding, is the great white throne the same as the Bema seat? No, two different judgments. Okay. Bema seat judgment is, is only for believers. Okay. Their works are judged. Believers' works are judged there. The great white throne judgment, people's works are also judged, but with a view of, of whether or not they deserve eternal life or not. And of course, for one sin, you're already out. Remember how many times Adam and Eve had to sin before they were out of God's presence? One sin, and it was equated to stealing out of the cookie jar. I mean, stealing a fruit off a tree, that's not a... I mean, that's how some people could look at it. It's not, it wasn't like he murdered, Adam murdered Eve. Uh, he just took a fruit that God said not to eat. And yet, to God, that was tantamount to murder. I mean, it, it just defiance of God. And any sin, in God's eyes, is sin. So, yeah. Yes? Yes, I, I think that, well, I, I personally um, have in mind that it is Jesus that, that judges. Um, you know, God will judge through Jesus. Um, and that, that's where I would say in verse 16, it's through Jesus, through Christ Jesus. But he is the standard. That... He is the standard, and he also is the, will be the one who judges on that day. Um, and uh, we'll, we will maybe witness that. I hope not. I, I personally don't want to, because I can see anyone out there and say, 
I'm just as bad as they are. I deserve what they deserve. And we do. The, the, what makes the difference is Jesus took our judgment for us. This is why we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why I've trusted in Christ's death for my sins, His payment for me. I've trusted that He is a resurrected, living Savior that gives eternal life to all who believe in Him. And so, um, yeah, it's a very important issue. Any other questions? Well, shall we? Yes. So, is Paul being, is this sarcasm? Is he, like... No, actually, I would take it very, very much the opposite. This is very serious courtroom. He is looking at, because the subject is how does God justify? And that's a forensic, legal uh, topic. In other words, God, when he saves people, he's working from a, the level of, of the legal first. And because... Um, that is a uh, it, to me it's the best way for God to save us is on the legal level in the sense that if, if he's the greatest authority in all the universe and he is there's no judge higher than him and there isn't then whatever he says stands forever mm -hmm. and so um, this is why justification is such a critical issue um, because that is done in the courts of heaven apart from being, you know, my merit. It's not done in my chest. Now, I receive the righteousness of Christ, um, but the, the being justified is something that God, when he takes his, his gavel, you know, I love these gavels like this. It's fun to be judge, you know. Um, but when God judges and God justifies, chapter 8, Romans 8, Nothing can change it. Romans 8, who shall bring a charge? Verse 33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Wow. I mean, if God justifies, no charges. Nothing can stand against you. Remember when, uh, when O.J. Simpson walked out of court? Yeah. Eric, that was to the jeers of the whole United States. He's guilty. Check his tennis shoes, you know? We, we, we had him dead to rights. You know, we, we knew he was guilty. And yet he bought the judge. I don't know who he bought. He spent a lot of money. He bought the, the jeweler. Jewel, 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 jewelry people. <laughs> and uh, he, you know, he's something. He, he bought them all jewelry, maybe. He, he did something to make the thing go away. Um... Once he, was, he walked out of that court, people could jeer and sneer at him and say what they wanted to. He was a free man. And uh, that's the way it is with us. God justifies we walk free, even though the devil's over there. Condemn him. He should die. You know, and the devil has his, his newspaper there, people rolling the films. You know, he should die, you know, and everything. And we walk out. We're free. Not because of us because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf on Calvary. Great news, isn't it? Yeah, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this hour that we've had to study here, and we pray, dear Father, that you would continue to teach us this great and important topic here of justification by faith alone in Christ alone. And Lord, please don't let us get it mixed up. And as we look at this uh, second uh, lane on this broad road that leads to hell, uh, the moral lane. Lord, there's um, morality doesn't get it. You would have to be absolutely perfect, and no one is. And so, Father, we, we trust in another uh, avenue.